Well, this evening, again, we're going, as I've already mentioned, we're going to finish this prayer that our Lord Jesus offered up for us so many years ago in that upper room on the evening before His uh, arrest, uh, His crucifixion, and, of course, His death and burial. Uh, what I'd like to do is just simply read the two verses we're going to be looking at, and as I read them, I uh, just want you to understand it, it um, took a little while to figure out exactly how this fit with the rest of the, um, of the prayer because Jesus isn't actually offering a petition. He's simply making some statements here, but they're not disconnected from what He has said. I think the way we need to understand what He's saying here is that these are simply arguments that the Lord is using to enforce, as it were, or you know, reasons, even as He gives in the Lord's Prayer. At the very end, when He says that when we pray, we should pray certain things, and then He says, for yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory. Here are reasons that the Lord gives to us that we can offer up to Him to enforce that, as it were, uh, our petitions. There's, again, reasons why the Lord should hear them and answer them. And I think that's what he is doing here. So let me read these verses, and then we'll take a look at them. He says this, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now, again, I think there's a couple of things going on here, but certainly these are reasons that the Lord is offering as to why His Father should hear Him, why He should grant to Him these particular things He has prayed for us. So, may the Lord bless our understanding of this passage this evening. Now, again, what is it that Jesus has prayed for us? Well, He has prayed that the Father would keep us, that He would protect us from the evil one, that He would protect us from the evil in this world, the evil that is in our hearts, so that uh, while we are in this world, we would be able to do the work that He has actually called us to do. And we've seen the reasons why we need to be protected from these things in order to do that. He also prayed for our unity, that the Father would subdue that particular sin of division that exists in our hearts so that we would be able, as the body of Christ, to present to the world a united front, uh, the witness of a people, again, from various uh, cultures, from various places on earth, who love the Lord and who show that love by their love for one another. Jesus tells us that we need to love one another and not just barely, you know, on a continuum from I hate you to I love you, just kind of barely skating past uh, I can tolerate you sort of thing. But we are to love one another as Christ has loved us. That's a pretty high calling. And then we saw this morning that He lastly prayed for our glorification, that the Lord might bring us to heaven where we might be blessed for all eternity as we get to see that which is the most glorious thing that we could possibly see in the world, and that is the glory of God in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ, the beatific vision. Now, tonight we come to the conclusion of Jesus' prayer, which, as I've already told you here, that what He offers to the Lord is not another request, but in a certain sense, a summary of what He has already said and using these things as arguments as to why the Father should hear Him and grant these requests that He has made to protect us and to bring us to heaven. And I believe that what is implied in these, three, in these things that He said are basically three reasons. That the Father should protect us because Jesus came into the world so that we might know Him, and of course, having come to know Him, that He would keep us. Secondly, because now that we know the Father, we have become those that will continue the work that Jesus came into the world to do, which is to reveal the Father uh, to those who don't know Him in this world. And thirdly, because through knowing the Father, we now have something very special within us. We have become the temples of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the love of God is dwelling in us, which Jesus says is, really amounts to His 
living in us. Uh, we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Jesus dwells in us, and for this reason, that's why we go out and we're, we want to do this work, but also why the Lord should protect us, why the Father should protect us. So let's take a look at these three things as we close this particular prayer of our Lord Jesus. First of all, that the Father should protect us because Jesus came into the world in order that we might know Him. Jesus says in verse 25, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. Now notice Jesus first points out the character of the world, the world into which the Father has sent him. They are a people who do not know the Father, a people who are in darkness, who are in the darkness of ignorance. Now, we might look around at people and, and think, well, you know, they have it made, they have got great gifts, great talents, some of them have written some great books and so forth, and we might think they have a lot going for them, but the Bible says they're in darkness. They're in the darkness of ignorance, ignorance regarding the Father. Now, it's not that they're ignorant of the fact that He exists. We know, we've heard many, many times that God has shown everyone that He does exist and what He is like through the light of nature. Nor does Jesus mean that they're completely ignorant of what the Father wants of them, what He requires from them. They know what God wants through the light of conscience. Conscience means with knowledge. Everyone has an innate knowledge of what God requires of us. Basically, the remnants of His law that was written on the heart of man as He originally created Him. But now, of course, which has become dim because man has fallen, but is still there, which is why when man does something wrong, his conscience tells him that and reminds him that he is in trouble. Now, Jesus is not saying they don't know God at all, they don't know what He requires, but what He means is that in spite of these things, their hearts are still in darkness, the darkness of sin. They still hate God. They still don't want to submit to God, and they still do everything they can actually to tear down the knowledge of God or to put what they do know about Him and what He wants out of their minds so that they can live the kind of life that they want to live. That's what Paul means when he writes in Romans 1.21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. And again, how do we know that that's true? Just look at the news and compare what the people of this world are doing, what the people of this world are like to what God tells them they should be like in His Word. And you'll see that what Jesus says with regard to the world itself, the world has not known you, and what Paul says that they became, um, well, futile in their speculations, their foolish heart was dark and they didn't honor God, you will see that those things are true. Well, it was into this world that the Father sent His Son, the one who does know Him, uh, into a world that doesn't know Him. One who knows Him far more intimately, what He is like and what delights Him, and one who not only knew these things, but who also loved Him with all of His heart and sought to please Him with all of His life. He sent Him into this world so that those who are in the, the darkness of ignorance might come to know Him, might come to know the Father, might come to have eternal life. And remember, eternal life is knowing the Father and Jesus Christ, who is the revelation of the Father. And we saw back in verses 1 and 2 that that is, as a matter of fact, why Jesus came into the world, the one who knows Him among those who do not know Him. Jesus spoke these things, John writes, and lifting up His eyes to heaven, He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son, that the Son may glorify You, even as You gave Him authority over all flesh, that to all whom You have given Him, He may give eternal life. In other words, in this world of people who are in the darkness of ignorance, who do not know the Father, Jesus may reveal the Father to them. 
And we know, of course, from Scripture, we know from the fact that Jesus has disciples who were gathered around him, that this errand in which the Father had sent him into the world to do was successful. There were those who came to know him, who were saved by his grace. And of course, if you love him this evening, you are one of those that Jesus has come into the world to reveal the Father to. And so Jesus prays. Uh, that as He has revealed the Father to you and as you have come to know the Father through Him, that the Father would keep you because you are one of those that He has come into the world to save. You are one of those that the Father has given to the Son as a reward for His work. You are the reason Jesus came into the world. So Jesus offers this as an argument as to why the Father should hear this prayer and protect you from the world. Now, secondly, Jesus prays that the Father would keep us because now that we have come to know Him, we are those who are called to continue this work in the world, as we've seen uh, numerous times already. Again, He prays in verse 25, essentially the fact that, that there are those who have come to know Him. O righteous Father, although the world has not known You, yet I have known You, and these have known that You've sent me, these have come to know you. Now, the majority of the world rejected Jesus. We know that that's true, but there are a few who have believed, and we are among that few who know that Jesus was sent from the Father, who through Jesus have been saved. And as we saw earlier, that makes us those that Jesus is sending to the world. As a matter of fact, the ones Jesus has sent to the world, the same world that hated Him, the same world that rejected Him and crucified Him. He said in verse 18, as in His prayer, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Remember, Jesus was leaving, the disciples are staying, everyone who knows Him and comes to know Him through their word, becomes then part of this army of people whom the Lord is working through in order to bring the gospel to the world. Now that we bear His image and have been entrusted with that same message uh, so that the world might come to know Him, now that we have been sent to the world and have the possibility of being hated by the world, basically we can look forward to the fact that we will be hated by the world because they hated Jesus. Now, Jesus is pointing this out. He pointed it out earlier to the Father, and He says what He is saying here, not because the Father didn't know that already. I mean, the Father knows everything. But He did it mainly for the benefit of His disciples. You know, a lot of what He prayed, remember how He prayed earlier, I say these things in the world so that their joy may be made full. The reason why Jesus prayed audibly, why in the hearing of His disciples was so that they would know He is praying for them, so that they would know these things are true, so that they may have joy. Now, Jesus is pointing these things out to the Father, not because His disciples did not know, but He was doing it for their benefit and for ours to argue that because this is the situation into which He is sending us, that we need His grace, we need His protection as we seek to be the lights that He has called us to be in this dark world. Now, Jesus prayed this for His disciples, and I think it's something that we should note that His disciples, uh, that this particular petition was actually fulfilled in their lives. Uh, Jesus sent them into the world, Jesus prayed for their protection, and they were protected. Now, we do need to note that it wasn't fulfilled immediately. We do know that before the evening is over, because as soon as this prayer is over, they're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there Jesus is going to pray, and there Judas is going to bring the soldiers, and there uh, the disciples are all going to scatter and abandon Jesus. So they're not going to see this fulfilled in their lives right away, but they will after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will see it fulfilled after the coming of the Holy Spirit. They believed what Jesus said in their hearing that the Father would protect them. And so they went out as Jesus sent them out. And they were not ashamed to own Jesus, even as Jesus 
was not ashamed to own them uh, before the Father. They went out and told others what Jesus had done to save them. And they went out to tell others that they would only believe that they also would be saved. And I say that simply to say that we need to believe the words of Jesus. We need to believe that the Father heard this petition. We need to believe that as He's called us to go out, that He will be with us in the same way He was with them. We simply need to trust and believe that the Lord will do as He said that He would do. One thing that Matthew Henry points out, which I think we know to be true but is very encouraging, and that is when we are willing to do this, when we are willing freely to acknowledge God, to acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord in the face of a world that hates Him at our own personal risk, this is pleasing to God. It pleases God when we do that because it shows that we trust Him, shows that we love Him, shows that we are seeking to obey Him. And the Lord promises that He will give a crown to those who do this, that He will bestow an honor and a glory that will distinguish them from others who aren't quite as willing to do this. And the question that this really asks us this evening is, are we willing to do it? Are we willing to own Him publicly, uh, believing that this request that Jesus made of the Father will be fulfilled? Not only that He will protect us, but there will be those who will respond to the gospel positively. There will be His sheep that will be gathered in. If we are willing to do this, if we are willing to do this in the face of a world that hates the Lord, He will reward us for it as well. Uh, these are, again, let me, let me just remind all of us here. You know, we can work for the things of the world and enjoy the things of the world while we're here. I'm talking about the things that we can legitimately enjoy as Christians. But we're going to lose all of it once we have to leave this world, and we have to leave this world pretty soon. The only thing that we get to keep is what we do for the Lord while we're here, and this is one of the things we get to keep. As we invest in the kingdom of heaven, as we think really about retirement, you know, let's not think about retirement when we stop working in this world in our latter years of retirement here, but retirement as retiring from this world and going to our eternal home. Let's think about storing up our retirement there that we might enjoy it forever rather than just the few years that we have to enjoy what we might gain of the world while we're here. Well, again, the point is Jesus sends us to continue this work, and He uses that as an argument why the Father would protect us because we're doing His work. We're doing what Jesus did, which is revealing the Father to others so that they might be saved. Now, finally, Jesus prays that the Father would keep us because through coming to know the Father by, again, our Lord Jesus Christ, we now have something very special in us. We have His love in us. And Jesus uh, defines that even a little bit further, and He says that He actually dwells in us by His Holy Spirit. And He says that in verse 26. I think this is an interesting uh, concept because it basically tells us that the purpose that Jesus had in coming into the world was to reveal the Father. And when He reveals the Father, that is salvation. He says, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. You know, there's almost a, um, there's almost a, a sort of a future element to this. Um, perhaps it's, it's a progressive thing that as we learn more about the Father, this love grows in us, or perhaps he was looking forward to the day of Pentecost and maybe he's pointing again to the difference between what you know, the, the work of the Holy Spirit was like in the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. But one thing is certainly true, that Jesus revealing the Father, making the Father known to us is tantamount to saving us. And when that is done, the Spirit of God, which is the love of God, dwells in us, and Christ actually is said to dwell in us. Now, Jesus said that He had made the Father's name known to them. 
by which he means that he made the Father known to them because really his name, God's name, is simply a revelation of God. Consider what the psalmist writes in Psalm 148, verse 13. He says, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. God's name represents God himself. It's not that God wants His name to be praised, but God is to be praised. He alone is exalted. His name is simply a revelation of Himself. By the way, that's why it's important that we use those names that God identifies Himself by, His name, that we use His name reverently because when we misuse His name, we are actually abusing Him which is why we don't want to hear blasphemy, we don't want to use blasphemy, uh, we don't want to misuse the name of the Lord. And let me just also mention one other aspect of that. The misuse of God's name is not just when it's used as a swear word, but it's also when you make a promise, take a vow. The Lord intends for you to keep that, and that's essentially what the third commandment says. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And what it means is when you take up His name and you swear to something uh, in the sense of this is true, this is false, or when you promise to do something, uh, he, you are basically calling Him to bear witness to it, and what you're saying is true or false, better be true or false, and what you're saying you're going to do, you, you, you better do, otherwise it's taking His name in vain. So we don't want to misuse His name because it is the revelation of Himself. But the idea is that Jesus came into the world to... Um, reveal His Father's name to make it known to them. Jesus, in everything that He did, in the time that He spent with His disciples, in all the teaching, in all the preaching, in all the miracles that He did, it was all for this reason, that He might reveal the Father. I think John focuses on that particular aspect of Jesus' ministry more than anything, more than any of the other writers or even the the writers of the epistles, it was that the Father might be known. Remember what eternal life is? That they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, early on in John's gospel, John tells us that this is the reason why Jesus came into the world. It was to reveal the Father. He says in John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Jesus came into this world to reveal the Father to us, to literally to exegete Him or to reveal Him or to explain Him to us, to show us what He was like. That is eternal life. Now, not that in and of itself because Jesus showed a lot of people and not everybody was saved, but there's a specific sense in which when He reveals the Father, we truly come to know Him in that sense of relationship versus just head knowledge of what He's like. Jesus prayed earlier in verse 6 of this prayer, I have manifested, manifested is an old word here, I don't know why they didn't update that when they, when they did this update, but he, I revealed your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Notice Jesus again calls this work of salvation revealing your name to the men whom you have given me. This is something that Jesus has to do before anyone can really believe in Him. He has to reveal the Father to us, and He's the only one who really can do this because He is the image of the invisible God. He is the exact representation of God's nature because He is God, the Son in human flesh. And this is, in fact, what Jesus does before He brings anyone into a relationship with His Father. He reveals His Father to Him. That was something that, was it Philip was a little bit, um, you know, mistaken about, uh, show us the Father, Jesus, it's enough for us. Have I been with you for so long and you still don't know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So getting that close connection between, you know, what, what Jesus came into the world to do, His relationship with the Father, Jesus came to reveal His Father to us, and that is 
eternal life. Now, Jesus points out in this passage, too, that this revelation of His Father is not just a one-time thing, but something that He begins and then continues to do once He has started. Look again at verse 26. He says, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known. Jesus intended to reveal more to his disciples about the Father. His, his death and, uh, on the cross reveals the justice of God. His resurrection reveals the faithfulness of God. Uh, the fact that he, after he died and was raised again from the dead, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days before he ascended. He continued to teach them about the Father and revealed even more about Him. And then on the day of Pentecost, when He poured out of His Holy Spirit, He did so to lead them into a deeper truth about the Father. And now that they're in heaven and they see the glory of God, as we saw this morning, shining from the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're learning still more. Now, Jesus has also revealed his Father to us if we believe in Him uh, this evening, if we're trusting Him, if we love Him. He has revealed the Father through His person, that is through Jesus, because He is the revelation of the Father. He has revealed the Father through His work so that we might come into a relationship with the Father through Him. And Jesus will reveal even more to us about Him. I think He does that virtually in everything that we experience in this world. Everything that happens to us in the world, everything He brings us through in the world is to teach us more about the Father, more about His grace, more about His love, more about His mercy, more about His, His holiness. And once we arrive in heaven, we, like the disciples who are there right now, are going to continue to learn more about Him as we gaze at His glory for the rest of eternity. And by the way, we're never going to learn it all. Jesus is going to be revealing the Father to us throughout eternity. And the more we learn about the Father, the more our joy and our happiness is going to continue to increase. So eternal life is knowing the Father, and that's what Jesus came to reveal to us is the Father. And He will continue to reveal even more about Him, which is why we need to learn. We need to receive what it is He's telling us and learn what He is like, become more intimate with Him, that we might love Him more and serve Him better. Now, Jesus revealed His Father so that we might be brought into a relationship with the Father through Him, so that we might be loved, you know, that we might know the Father, that we might love Him, and that we might be loved by Him. But Jesus goes on to say that it was also so that His love might be in us. And it's interesting, he calls it the same love with which he loves his son. He says in verse 26, And I have made your name known to them and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Now, I want you to note here this, this I think, a very important fact. Jesus didn't come into the world to reveal His Father to us, in other words, to sort of hand to us a textbook of theology so that we might have lofty ideas about God and that we might discuss them amongst ourselves or argue amongst ourselves about them or with people who have differing opinions. But rather, He came to reveal His Father to us so that He might secure for us our ultimate happiness. Not only that we might be loved by Him, and His Father, but that the love that they share with one another, the spirit of love with which the Father anointed Jesus might actually be in us. The Spirit of God might dwell in us. Uh, this, this, is, this becomes a part of Jonathan Edwards' thinking as he tries to explain the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. He believes the Spirit is basically the love the Father has for the Son, and the love that the Son reciprocates and has for the Father, the love that they share, the love with which the Father has loved the Son, Jesus says He's revealed the Father so that that love might actually dwell in us. But what is that love that dwells in us except the Holy Spirit? 
This is what Peter is referring to when he says that, that through the Lord Jesus Christ, we have become partakers of the divine nature. Not that we're, we have become God or that somehow our, our you know, created being has become uncreated, infinite being. We don't become God, but we do share something with God, something that Jesus said was very important that binds us together with the Father and the Son and binds us all together as Christians, and that is the Spirit of God. Uh, Jesus prayed, well, not just Jesus, but others, the Apostle Paul refers to the Holy Spirit as the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. He refers to Him as that that principle of the Spirit that fulfills within us that law of God, a principle of holiness. Basically, it is that which the Father gives to us that draws our souls out to Him so that we will love Him. Remember, the primary fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, and all the things that follow after that are simply different ways in which love expresses itself in the life of the believer. So basically, Jesus revealed the Father to us so that we might have His love in us, and that is the Holy Spirit, so that we might love Him in return, so that we might follow Him, so that we might be willing to do all that He has called us to do. And when we, of course, see this love within us, we not only know that we have eternal life, we not only know that the Spirit of God is in our souls. But Jesus tells us that He Himself lives in us by His Holy Spirit. Again, He says at the end of verse 26, He revealed the Father to them so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Now, when the Spirit of God takes up residence in our hearts and that love is expressed through us, that love, again, which the Father has for the Son, the Son has for the Father, it, it shows something about us. It shows that we have a new relationship with, uh, well, with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit is the bond of union that exists between us and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's what unites us to Jesus Christ so that we are said to be in Christ. It's very important to be in Christ because only those who are in Christ are actually going to see heaven. We have to be in union with Him. But when we are in union with the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not only in Him, but He also is in us. As we saw in Colossians 1.27, Paul writes, To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Remember how Paul also says in Galatians 2.20 that, uh, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The way that He lives in us is by the Holy Spirit. Now, here's, here's the, that's, that's important to understand, but now here's the point behind why Jesus even brings it up. If we are in Christ, and if Christ is in us, and if the Spirit of love dwells in our souls so that we now seek to honor the Father by loving Him, by trusting Him and submitting to Him, why shouldn't the Father, why wouldn't He protect us as we go out to do His work in the world? Jesus says, I, I revealed you to them, Father, so that your love would be in them, so that I would take up my residence in them, and so this is why you should protect them, because they are yours, because I am in them because they love you, because you love them. Now, the Father will answer such a prayer, and Jesus knows that He will, because He knows what His Father is like. One thing I didn't point out is how Jesus begins this statement in verse 25. He says, O oh, righteous Father, He knows that the Father is righteous. He knows that the Father will always do what is right. He will do what Jesus is asking Him to do because He's the one that sent Jesus into this world in order to purchase this blessing for us. And He's the one who gave these to Jesus to protect 
And he's the one that Jesus is now praying would protect them as he's leaving the world and leaving them in the world to do his work. And that's why also, if you have trusted Jesus, if you love him and you're following him, the Father will protect you. You will never perish, but you will live forever in his presence because Jesus prayed for you. This prayer is the basis of our salvation. It's because of Jesus' work. It's because of His, his sacrifice and His prayer that we are saved and we will see these things. And the Father is more than willing to do all these things for those whom Jesus was willing to give His life for. So as we think about going out to do what the Lord has left us into the world to do, which is to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ, even though it may seem daunting at times because the audience is hostile toward the message. Let's not forget that our Lord Jesus has prayed for us and He will protect us. The Father will protect us. He'll make sure that none of us are lost. No one can take us away from Him. Nothing in heaven or earth can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's remember that He has made every provision for us. We simply need to trust Him and do it as the disciples did so that the kingdom might expand, so that it might grow. And remember as well that if you're willing to do this and trust the Lord, stick your neck out as it were, although you're not really because there's no, nothing left to chance here. It's absolutely certain. The Lord does say that He will reward you and He will bless you and He will distinguish you according to what you do for His glory in this world. So again, thinking of that ultimate retirement that uh, we have when we, all of us are going to leave this world, uh, the youngest of us, the oldest of us, it's going to be a very short time. We should be thinking about what's that world like that we're going to. First of all, make sure that our souls are secure in Christ, that He has revealed <clears throat> the, the Father to us. Uh, because His love is in us, we can know that He has, because His love is in us, because Christ is in us. But let's also think about having had that revelation that not everyone is going to shine with the same glory in heaven. It's going to be dependent upon what we do for Him while we are here. There are rewards, so we should be thinking about those as well. Well, may the Lord grant us uh, the grace to do that. Let's, let's bow in a few moments of prayer, and let's ask Him to help us uh, apply these words.